good morning, 10 o'clock service. Hey, great to see you all. I also want to real quickly welcome our online audience. Uh, we're really glad to have you joining us today as well. There's a whole lot I'm really excited about. I want to share a couple of those things with you real fast. Before I do, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Matt. I serve on the pastoral team here at ACC, and it's uh, an honor and a privilege on most Sundays to be able to hang out up here and uh, share and, some, and teach some things out of, out of God's Word. Uh, let me tell you about something I'm super excited about. Uh, we have three new full-time staff people starting this week that we have been praying about and looking for. Isn't that awesome? This is a huge, huge uh, turning point for, for our church. It's going to be a really neat uh, experience as we welcome them in. Make sure you're here next week. We're going to have an opportunity to meet our new team, and we're going to do our best to introduce them to you through our top, th our weekly three that we send out via email this week. So check in. If you normally don't read our weekly three, uh, choose to not just put it in your junk box this time. Open it up. We have some important uh, uh, introductions in there for you. Another thing I'm really excited about is our Easter Sunday service coming up on April 1st. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we've added a fourth service time for Easter Sunday at 1 o'clock. So if you, uh, you can see this room already, we, we're pretty uh, full uh, here at 10 o'clock. So one thing we're asking our 10 o'clock and our 11.30 service people to consider is choosing a different time to worship on Easter so that there's room for our guests who only come to church every once in a while. We want to make sure there's room for them, uh, even though we love and appreciate you. That's one way we can serve our community together. Another thing about Easter Sunday, we are going to be doing just a ton of baptisms on Easter Sunday. We have a lot of people, if you've noticed, there haven't been as many baptisms this past month. Uh, that's because as we've been kind of gearing up towards Easter, people have asked, can I get baptized on Easter Sunday? And we're postponing uh, till Easter. If you need to be baptized... If you've given your life to Christ and you're at that moment where you understand that you're, you're not being obedient and when you, when you choose not to be baptized, why not Easter Sunday? Check out the symbolism. Easter Sunday is a day we celebrate a resurrected Savior. And in baptism, you go under the water and you're brought back up, resurrected into newness of life. It's such an incredible Sunday to be baptized. If you need to be baptized and you'd like to be baptized on Easter uh, make sure to let someone know. Put it on your Connect card. Let us know at the big green wall. We'd be happy to walk you through that process. So we are in week two of Psalm 23. And if you were here last week, you know that we talked about kind of the lush, the green pasture part of life, the, the parts where we get to rest and, and be refreshed and restored. It's the part that all of us would say, Matt, sign me up for that. That sounds really great. I need some of that. But now we find ourselves in that part of Psalm 23 that is a little bit more ominous. We find ourselves now talking about those other parts of our lives where we're walking through the darkest valleys, or some, some of you would say the, the valley of the shadow of death. As we talk about that this morning, I want to start by reading all of Psalm 23 together with you. So if you would open up your Bible, I've, I've put Psalm 23 up on the screen so that we can say it out loud together out of the same translation so if you want to read along with me, uh, let's do this together. Psalm 23, it says this, read, uh, out loud with me. The Lord is my shepherd, I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid. For you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Six verses. Six verses make up Psalm 23, and there is so much crammed into these six verses, so much uh, truth. I've been so encouraged this week to hear your feedback on how many of you uh, really kind of something about those first couple of verses last week spoke to, uh, to many of you. 
uh, I'm hoping and I'm praying that these next couple of verses will also be incredibly meaningful for you. In fact, let's uh, take a moment and pray together and ask God to bless uh, Psalm 23 and the teaching of it today. Father, I ask right now that you would uh, use me as, as a vessel. God, that you would speak through me and that as we're exploring and examining the truth that's here in Psalm 23, that you would help us to see what it looks like in those moments of our lives that we would consider the dark valleys. I know there are people in this room right now that are in a valley. God, I pray specifically for those people that as we speak and as you speak through me and as we, we look and, and learn what it looks like to, to be in those moments, God, that for those of us who find themselves in a valley, that you would, that you would speak in a, in a really clear way today. Help each of us to be transformed more into the image of your Son through this teaching. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, uh, we, we talked a lot about last week the symbolism in Psalm 23. We have God who plays the role of the shepherd in this psalm. And then humanity, you and I, we play the role of sheep. And how that is really a great uh, symbol for us. Because we are like sheep in so many ways in so many ways. One of the ways that we are like sheep that I also want you to know about is sheep are creatures of habit. They like to follow the same paths. In fact, you can go, uh, if there's a a kind of a a flock of sheep that aren't being really well shepherded and aren't being led where they need to be and moved from, from pasture to pasture, you'll find these ruts where the sheep always travel along the same paths. They're the paths that the sheep prefer, that they want to stick to, They will eat at the same pasture until someone moves them from one place to another. And we are like that as well, aren't we? We don't like change. We like to do things our way. We like to follow the path that we like to follow that makes sense to us because it's the way we see other people going ahead of us. In fact, we see this, uh, a couple verses that describe us. Isaiah uh, 53 verse 6 says, All of us, I love this, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. In other words, if you are uh, in this room, this this is about you and I. We, like sheep, have gone and done things our own way. We don't like to be led. Proverbs 14, 12 says, There is a path before each person that seems right. There is a path before each person that seems right, but in the end, it leads to death. This is another important truth that... uh, We like to do things our own way, but at the end of the path, it's not a good thing for us. You see, the truth is that sheep must be led. We require someone to to lead us. Otherwise, we left our own devices. We do things the same way over and over again, and it's not good. We find ourselves uh, not growing and, and not moving and not going where we're supposed to. And that's where we we find ourselves in Psalm 23. Psalm 23, uh, verse 3, ends with this. It says, He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to His name. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to His name. If you have your Bible out, would you do me a favor and circle those words, right paths. Because it's very important for us to understand that the Good Shepherd takes us on the the right path. Now, there might be a path that you prefer. There might be a path that seems more comfortable. There might be a path that looks a little bit easier. But you have to understand at some point that when the good shepherd is the one leading you, the good shepherd always has a path for you or paths for you. And those paths, according to Scripture, are the right ones. Whether you can see it or not, whether you like it or not, whether you know it or not. The right paths are the paths that that Jesus has laid out for you. We see this in John 14, 6. It says, Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. In other words, Jesus not only knows the best best path, uh, but through Jesus is the path. We find the the right path through Jesus Christ. And then we see in John 10, 10, that the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. But my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. In other words, 
we, we understand, it's easy to say maybe on a Sunday in this context, that Jesus' paths, that God's paths are the right paths, yet time and time again, we choose to do things our own way. Let me prove this to you. This is a game I like to play when I'm hanging out with kids or youth in a youth group. Uh, I'm going to teach this game to you, all right? So here's how, how we play this. When my hands cross, I want you to clap. It's, see, that's, that's the rule. It's real. Watch this. You guys ready? Be ready. Here we go. Perfect. So you guys know how to play this game. Now, if I do, like, no, come on. Here we go. Good. See, you got this. So that's how it works, right? So I tell you how to play the game. I teach you the way to play the game. And now I'm going to, uh, a lot of people, uh, you know, sometimes you don't know if I'm going to trick you, right? You don't know if I, I maybe I look like I'm going to cross. I'm not really going to cross. Well, let me, let me help you out. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go two times and I'm actually going to cross. And then on the third time, I'm going to pretend like I'm going to cross, but I'm going to stop short. I'm just going to tell you ahead. I'm going to give you the heads up. All right, here we go. You ready? See, see, every time, every time, I'm, I'm actually very impressed. There was only a few of you uh, who decided it was time to clap there. You know, it's funny how in life we, we look at, we even know the path, we know the rules. Like, hey, he's not going to cross on the third one. And then our mind starts playing games. We start to tell ourselves, well, I think that he probably is going to cross his hands. Or he probably is tricking us. Or I think, I, I, I don't want to be the one guy who's not clapping. I'm, you know, whatever it is, we start, we start thinking that we know what's best and we do things our own way, even when we have the right path right in front of us. Listen, if you are a follower of Christ, you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you to guide you. You have the ability to know the right path. And yet time and time again, we find ourselves doing things our own way because we think we know better. And that's a problem. But listen, if you're taking notes, write this down. God's paths are always right. God's paths are always right. It doesn't matter if it makes sense. It doesn't matter if it doesn't seem to to fit in your picture of the American dream. It doesn't matter if it makes logical sense or if your financial advisor tells you it doesn't make sense. It doesn't matter what anybody tells you. It doesn't matter what you tell you. God's paths are always right. And here's the the funny thing about that statement is that's really easy to accept when you're in the lush pasture lying down in green grass. You're like, yeah, no problem, God. I will follow you into lush pastures any day. But then we get to verse 4. And it becomes a whole lot more difficult as a follower of Christ to say, yes, even then. In fact, those, phrase, that, those two words, even then, are very important because they lead us into verse 4. I'm going to put it up on the screen. It says this, even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid. For you are close beside me, your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. I love the, that word, even when the shepherd wants to lead you through a dark valley. God's paths are always right. In good, times that make sense to you, and in the times that don't make sense to you, God's paths are always right. I want to share with you five things that are true about valleys. Five things that you will find to be true. And I think everyone in this room, you have experienced a valley before. Or you are in the middle of a valley right now. If you are not in a valley right now, just give it time. You will find yourself in one. And that brings us to the first truth about valleys. Is that valleys are inevitable. Valleys are inevitable. They're going to happen. Uh, We all know this. We've all experienced valleys. We know. uh, We all love promises in the Bible. We read a verse and we're like, oh man, that is such a great promise. I'm going to write that down. I'm going to put that up on my refrigerator. Let me read to you a promise that never gets put up on the refrigerator. Here's a promise in Scripture. John 16 says, Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Nobody likes this promise. Hey, let me just promise you guys something. Guess what? You're going to go through some really hard times. Wait, what? I don't like that promise. 
We find 1 Peter 4.12 says, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you are going through, as if something strange were happening to you. In other words, everybody's going to go through valleys. It's not unique to you. It's nothing strange is happening just to you. God isn't picking on you. Valleys are inevitable for all of us. Number two, valleys are unpredictable. Have you ever had a flat tire at a good time? <laughs> you ever been driving down the road and, and said, you know what? Now would be a great time for a flat. <laughs> you see, I've noticed in my life that your day can go from great or normal to darkest valley in an instant. Do me a favor. Think about a dark valley that you've gone through in your life. Think about the darkest valley that you've experienced in your life. And I, I bet if you trace it back to the beginning, it started with a phone call or a letter or a meeting in your boss's office or something. It was, it was just a matter of a moment and your day went from great to terrible. You see, valleys are, are completely unpredictable. Uh, for me, one of my darkest valleys, many of you know this story, when I was a sophomore in high school, on a normal good day, I was in algebra class, I got called out of class over to the principal's office. When I got there, my brother and sister, who were also students at the same high school, were also there, and in a second, my whole life was flipped, turned upside down. My, my dad came into the office in tears to tell me that my mom had passed away that morning from a heart attack. And in a second, completely out of the blue, the way valleys seem to come, things were changed in my life. Jeremiah 4.20 says, Waves of destruction roll over the land until it lies in complete desolation. Suddenly, my tents are destroyed. In a moment, my shelters are crushed. Another way of saying this might be, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, a windstorm is going to come by and your trash is going to be all over the street. <laughs> we know what that looks like this week, don't we? <laughs> Number three, valleys are impartial. Valleys are impartial. Valleys, uh, it doesn't matter if you are rich or poor. It doesn't matter if you're black or you're white. It doesn't matter if you are good or you're bad. It doesn't really matter who you are or what you think you are entitled to. Valleys are impartial. We actually see this in Matthew 5. It says, For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and unjust alike. Number four, valleys are temporary. All of a sudden now, we see a little bit of hope. One of my favorite parts of verse 4 is this, this idea, though I walk, what's the next word? Through the valley. In other words, it's a promise right in Scripture that valleys are temporary. They weren't designed by God to be like where you end up and land. They are a temporary uh, piece that we walk through these valleys together. They are a temporary thing. 1 Peter 1.6 says this, So be truly glad. If you're in a valley right now, listen to this. So be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. You see, the good shepherd keeps his sheep moving. He understands the danger that is on every side as you're walking through a valley. And he wants to keep us moving so that we don't get stuck. And many times what we do is we stop or we roll over on our back and we get cast, right? And we, we find ourselves not going through the valley maybe the way we ought to. But the truth is that valleys are temporary. Now I want to address something because when you are a follower of Christ, I believe this promise to be true every single time. Some of you might be thinking right now, the, the translation maybe that you see in your Bible is though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And when you hear that, that line that is brought up at funerals often, you might be thinking of someone. You're saying, you know what? That person went into a valley and they never came out of it. Well, I want to challenge that idea. 
God sometimes doesn't bring you out of the valley on this earth. Sometimes the bringing you through and out of a valley into something much better happens through death. And that is something that we as followers of Christ, when you believe in Christ and the promises he has for you, when you've committed your life to the good shepherd, you no matter what, the Bible even says, what is the worst they can do to me? Kill me? It doesn't matter what happens to you when you're a follower of Christ. That valley will be temporary. That is a cool promise. And then the, number five is valleys are purposeful. Valleys are purposeful. I want to spend some time explaining this from uh, David's perspective. David was a shepherd uh, when he was younger. So he understands what it means to be a shepherd. And he understands sheep and their needs. And in, in the, the Palestine area where David would have been a shepherd, he understands this, this important truth. During the winter and the spring, you keep your shepherd, your sheep, sorry, your, the shepherd keeps its sheep at home, on kind of your home field. You, you understand that that's the best place to care for and protect your sheep. But the truth is that you have to get your sheep moved away from home and up the mountain above the ridge line before summer hits. Because what happens at summer is the heat is so overwhelming that most of the water sources dry up, the grass dies, there's nothing for your sheep to eat at, at the bottom of the mountain. So a good shepherd understands that I have to, uh, before summer is in kind of full swing, I have to take my sheep on purpose up this mountain. I have to get them up this mountain. We even see, remember when, when Samuel's trying to pick a new king, and, and all of David's brothers are there. And then, nope, not you, not you, not you. Do you have any other sons? Remember, David wasn't just outside. They had to send for David. Why? Because David wasn't at home with the sheep. He was up the mountain with the sheep. He knew that that was the only way for sheep to survive through that season. So we find ourselves understanding that a good shepherd knows when it's time to take you through a valley and up the mountain. A good shepherd knows that there is a time and a place for doing that in your life with very, very uh, specific purposes involved for you. There's, there's purpose. And, and we all know, too, that the way up a mountain is through the valleys. That's where sheep are going to find a water source. That's where they're going to find streams. That's where they're going to find food to eat on the journey up. The valleys are the places where you find that you, that's how we actually build our roads, right? We find the valleys and we, we work our way up to the top of the mountain. That's how a shepherd would lead its sheep. So when David, we, we, sometimes we think, why, why does the good shepherd take his sheep into the valley at all? Listen, it is with a lot of purpose that a good shepherd is going to lead you through the valley. We have words that we use in our in our Christian circles sometimes and one of the one of those phrases kind of a cliche phrase that we'll use is this idea of uh, like I, I want to move like up the mountain I want to have this mountaintop experience with God maybe sometimes you come home from a mission trip or a retreat and you think man that was just such a such a kind of like a spiritual high you know we understand this idea of being up on a mountain in our spiritual journey well guess what to get there you got to walk through valleys a good shepherd understands. You know, sometimes we watch these. I don't know if you are like me, but there's really cool snowboarding videos where you see some guy who's at the top of a mountain, completely untouched by, you know, the snow. There's not other skiers. There's no lift that took this guy up there. And guess what? He didn't walk up there either. You want to know how he got there? A helicopter dropped him off at the top of this mountain. Now, that would be great if God was just every once in a while, all right, let's church. I'm going to helicopter my flock up to the top of the mountain. But that's not how it works. We don't have the luxury of a helicopter that's going to take us to the high points, to the, the peaks of our spiritual faith. We have to understand that, that some of the most incredible, you ask people their story about the, the moments in their life where God was just working, the, that taught them the most and was working the strong and most visibly was just doing incredible things in their life. And they will tell you that it was coming out of a valley on, the, on their way to the top of a mountain. God has a purpose for bringing us through these valleys. And understanding that, I want to share with you three ways that you can be victorious when you're in the valley. 
You are either in a valley right now or you will be there soon. So how do we as a church prepare and know what to do so that we can be victorious when we find ourselves in a valley? And the first thing I want to encourage you to do is this. Number one, do not panic. Do not panic when you find yourself in a valley. We see in scripture it says, though I walk through. This word walk is really important. It's this walking and through are both important. It's, it's not a, when I get freaked out, I just start running through, and trying to get out of this valley as quick as possible. We don't see that. We also don't see when I find myself in a valley, turning around and running the other direction. We don't see that. We see this idea of allowing the good shepherd to gently and calmly, without chaos, walking you through this valley. It's this, this understanding of, of not panicking. And then it also, uh, the very next phrase says this, um, I will not be afraid. I will not be afraid. It's this understanding that we get to choose our reaction. It's a, it implies choice. And the best way to do that is this phrase I have on the screen for you. is a focus on God's power instead of on your problem. When you find yourself in a valley and you don't want to panic, when you're doing your best to not panic in this valley, the best way to do that is to fix your eyes on the good shepherd instead of focusing and fixing your eyes on your problem. Maybe your problem is uh, mourning the loss of someone. Maybe your, your valley is something to do with losing a job or, or struggling with an addiction or there's these valleys that we find ourselves in. Listen, instead of focusing on the problem, focus and fix your eyes on the good shepherd. That's going to help you not panic and to know that you're being led through this valley on purpose. It's amazing to me how two people in an identical situation can end up with very different results if one panics and one chooses to trust. I've, I found this to be true in my own experience. When my mom passed away, when I was a sophomore in high school, um, my brother and my sister panicked. My dad panicked. And I don't know why, but for whatever reason, I found myself not panicking. I found myself relying on God and his church in a way that I never had before. I found myself relying on the good shepherd and staying closer by his side than I had ever before in my life. And you watch in the exact same situation what God was able to do as he led me through this valley as I chose to not panic and the same experience with my brother and sister. Now listen, my, my brother, he's still lost. He's still wandering. He's never survived his panic. My sister, many of you know my sister. I probably should have gotten permission before I told you all this. <laughs> my sister, uh, Jesus came up and found her cast and put her back on her feet. And she, she caught up, man. She challenges me in my own faith. It's just amazing to see how God has allowed her to, to not be stuck. But listen, when you find yourself in a valley, choose not to panic. Psalm 34, verse 4 says, He freed me from all my fears. Hebrews 12, 2 in the message paraphrase says, Keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished this race we're in. Study how he did it, because he never lost sight of where he was headed. That exhilarating finish in and with God. He could put up with anything along the way. Cross, shame, whatever. Number two, another way to be victorious in the valley is to rest in the fact that God is with you. Rest in the fact that that good shepherd is not going to leave your side. The only one who's going to wander off or get uh, stop and, and not move anymore, that's, that's us. The good shepherd is always with you in the valley. You're not going to go through a valley alone. In fact, as a, as a follower of Christ, for those of us in the room who've made a decision to follow Jesus 
and to, to trust him with our lives. But one of the things that happens in that moment is you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In other words, you have uh, the, the Spirit of God living inside of you. You are never going to go through a valley alone. I want to point out something that I think is remarkably amazing in Psalm 23. If you have your Bible, I want you to see this. I want you to experience it with your eyes the same time I do. This isn't actually on the screen, so look, look down. You'll notice in verses 1 and 2 and 3 that when David is talking about God, he says, He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside streams. He renews. He guides. And then check out what happens in verse 4. It says, Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are with me. You see what happens here? I think it's an incredible truth about what we ought to do when we're trusting and resting in the fact that God is with us. When you find yourself in a valley, nobody wants to talk about God. We switch. We want to talk to God. We want to draw closer to God, uh, not just in our language, but in just any way we can. We want to draw closer to our Savior in that moment. And that's what David does here. We find ourselves talking about God, and then David switches to talking directly to his good shepherd in those dark valleys. It's such a, a cool truth. Isaiah 43, verse 2, says this. When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. And when you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. In other words, we have the exact same thing said three times because we, like sheep, sometimes need to hear things multiple times, don't we? When you find yourself in a valley, you are going to get through. Rest in the fact that the Good Shepherd is with you. And the third thing I want us to do when we find ourselves in a valley so that we can be victorious is to rely on God's protection. To rely on God's protection. We see at the, the last part of verse 4, it says this, uh, Your rod and staff protect and comfort me. Your rod and staff. Sometimes we imagine those are the same things. Uh, they're actually two different tools that a shepherd like David would have been very familiar with. It's the two things a shepherd keeps with him. A rod is it's about maybe two or three feet in length. It's cut from a little sapling, so they'll find a little baby tree and cut it down at the roots. And that spot where the kind of the roots start, that little spot, they'll, they'll kind of carve it into a ball, into like a bulb, if you will, at the top of this club. And this club uh, was used as a symbol of God's power. It was, it was something a shepherd would use practically to protect his sheep. And there was a lots of ways shepherd, shepherds would use this, this rod, this rod uh, they would practice when they were out on the field and there was nothing kind of harming and nothing to, to worry about. This actual shepherd would, uh, these shepherds would take their rod and they would practice throwing these things at long distances until they were very good at hitting their target. They knew how to take this rod and throw it so they could protect the sheep against a predator. But they also knew how to throw this rod to protect not only us against a predator, but to protect us from us. They knew how to take this thing to discipline our, their sheep or to take the rod and to throw it. If they saw a sheep kind of wandering by a cliff, they would throw the rod so that it would land next to the sheep and scare it back into the folds of the flock. You see, the good shepherd has this tool that symbolizes the power of God that is used to protect us from outside evil, to protect us from ourselves, to protect us from each other. This tool is used to keep us safe. Because listen, in these valleys... These valleys are dangerous. At any moment, it could start raining and they would see a flash flood coming down this ravine. There could be a, a mud slide or an avalanche. Uh, there were all sorts of places for predators to hide in the valley. And the sheep know this, that the best place to be when you're in the valley is close by the shepherd. Because the shepherd has the tool necessary to protect you from evil. This tool... This rod is a very important piece of this. Then there's another tool, the staff. 
And the staff is, is it's like a, it's, you kind of picture a candy cane. It's a long piece of wood with a, with a hook on the end. And this hook really symbolizes, the staff symbolizes God's care. We have the rod, which is God's power, and we have the staff, which is God's uh, grace and his power and kindness. And this, this staff would be used also to help guide us and keep us where we ought to be. If a, if a little lamb would wander away from its mother, the, the good shepherd would know to pick up the lamb with the hook and to carry it back over and put it back with its mom so that the shepherd doesn't put his scent on the lamb. The, the shepherd would use this staff to, to help uh, loose a, a sheep from inside like thorns. If they get stuck inside weeds, it would be used to gently pull us out. It would be used to carry a, a, a sheep over a barrier. If there's a fence or a rock that someone can't, a shepherd would be able to use this to carry uh, and, and lift. This is a tool that the good shepherd uses to guide us and move us and keep us where we need to be. So we have this, this rod, God's power, and we have this staff, God's care and protection. And listen, when you find yourself in a valley, you can rely on God's power and protection. So I want to close with this idea. I, I like to finish with this idea of so what? What do we do now that we understand uh, Psalm 23 verses 3 and 4? What do we do with this truth? And something I want to share with you, uh, your version of this might have said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We have this picture of a shadow and one thing I want to, a couple things I want to tell you about a shadow in closing. Number one, shadows always appear bigger than they really are. Have you noticed that? Shadows are deceptive. They're not a good picture of what, uh, you know, they're just, they seem bigger than they actually are. The other thing about shadows is shadows, uh, they, they can't hurt you. Shadows are, they, they can't hurt you. But my favorite thing about a shadow is that the fact that a shadow even exists is proof of a source of light. The fact that you find yourself in a shadow is proof that there is a source of light. And a lot of times that shadow that's, uh, that, we're in, that we're staring at, that shadow that's causing anxiety and fear and worry in our lives, you know whose shadow it is? It's ours. We're staring down at our own shadow and it seems big and scary and all these things. But the, the problem is, is that we're facing the shadow means we're not facing the source of light. And all we got to do is turn around and be reminded that the, the, the light of the world is right behind us. We don't need to be afraid of our shadows. Psalm 34, I don't have this verse on the screen for you, so just listen to this. this as we're talking about shadows, it says... In verses 5 and 6, those who look to him for help will be radiant with joy. No shadow of shame will darken their faces. In my desperation, I prayed and the Lord listened. He saved me from all my troubles. So are you in a valley right now? If not, you will be soon. And as a church, let's be prepared Let's understand how to go through valleys with victory. Let's be prepared for how and what God is doing and teaching us as we stick to his path. Because God's path is always the right one. On your way home today, as you're in the car, maybe you have someone in your car with you you can talk to. Uh, maybe you're in your own car and you can talk to God about this. Here's the question I want you to talk about on your way home today. What area of your life are you sticking to your own ruts? And where do you need to trust the Lord's leading to get on his right path for you? Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for this truth. Thank you for working through uh, David's psalm here in 23. I ask that you would teach us and show us areas of our life where we're sticking to our own ways. We're not allowing you to lead us we're not allowing you to put us on the right path. And God, for those of us who find ourselves in a valley, allow us the, the, to trust you in it, to understand that you're going to guide us through it. And God, for anyone in this room who has yet to trust you as the good shepherd, for those in this room that don't yet know you as a savior the way I do, God, I pray right now that you would 
have revealed yourself to them in a mighty way today. That they would see today that they don't need to go through this life anymore shepherdless. But that they can rely on you and your spirit to lead them and guide them and to get them through. Because you love us so radically. God, for anyone who's, who, who fits into that, I pray that you'd give them the courage to, to tell someone. Maybe to come and tell me that they want to give their life to Jesus. And we can, we can lead them today. And God, thank you for working in us. We ask that you'd help us to take this home and apply it to our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't forget, join us next week. Uh, I think there's a thing called uh, time change, so don't come at the wrong time. See you guys then.